Hi, everyone. This is Adam, and I will be leading the service today for the first time in my life. Uh, seeing all your smiling faces makes me feel a little less nervous. And um, I'd like to thank very much Verena and Jim Taylor for help with organizing this. And I figure that if I mess it up, at least you will all have an excellent chance to practice Christian values of tolerance and forgiveness. So without further ado, could I ask if there are any guests present today that we could announce and meet? Not hearing anyone, I will move on to ask if there are any announcements that you would like to share with us. No announcements. Let's hope we do better with the God moments. <laughs> Can I ask people to share their God moments from the past week? Well, I, I can certainly share one. Uh, as many of you know, uh, we had a bit of a medical incident with uh, Muriel on Thursday. It was quite traumatic for both of us. I'm sure my blood pressure went up a notch or two. Uh, and, and, and if you don't know, uh, Muriel is just fine at the moment, so uh, we're, we're okay. But the God moment was on Friday. I had to do a little grocery shopping. And... Um, I was in Superstore, and the woman in front of me had a rather large order, over $500 worth. And I guess Superstore was giving away poinsettias to people that had large orders. And um, as I was standing in line putting things on the belt, this woman turned to me and said, would you like a poinsettia? And I said, that would be lovely. And, uh, and that my wife would really appreciate it as well because she just loves poinsettias. And uh, I was just overwhelmed. The poinsettia itself is huge. Uh, the pot is at the top is probably 10 or close to, close to 12 inches in diameter. The plant stands almost two feet high. And she dropped this thing into my cart and I was just overwhelmed. I, uh, I was almost brought to tears. Uh, and to have that happen after such a traumatic day the day before, uh, I was just, I was really feeling blessed. And um, I talk about random acts of kindness. Yeah. So that was my, my God moment for the week. Uh, the other, I guess I need to also share that uh, I was really overwhelmed with the calls and emails and text messages of kindness and concern. Uh, for Muriel, and I just thank everybody for uh, for their caring. Wonderful, thank you, Tom. Anyone else to share a God moment? Yeah. Uh, Sharon first. I just wanted to say, oh, which oh, Sharon? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, ahead, Sharon Taylor. Go Sharon ahead. Taylor first. <laughs> I just wanted to say that I've had lots of God moments this week. Um, she's asleep right now, I think. Mm -hmm. Oh, there she is. Oh. Who is this? Um, I'm at church. Um, I've had lots of God moments this week. Catherine is doing better. And just so many, so many wonderful interactions with the healthcare providers that have worked. <coughs> that would just work so long hours. Uh, I, we, we are really blessed. All of us are with the healthcare providers that we have. And uh, I'm so grateful. Amen. Amen. Sharon Hartway. Hi, well, our God moment has been about baby Emily because she is home now. And we actually got over, got over to see her on Wednesday morning and hold her and She's just so beautiful. Lot, lots of challenges ahead, I'm sure, but um, it was just such a, I was in tears actually when I held her. So <laughs> tears of joy. <laughs> yes. 
Thank you. Any others? Yeah, I have one. I uh, was fortunate enough on Friday evening to have dinner with my stepson and uh, stepdaughter and my two nieces. Um, and uh, they, to realize that even in this time of, of uh, epidemic and whatever, we, we can still even though many miles separate us, uh, my stepdaughters from Inuvik uh, had come down uh, to the coast here uh, a couple of weeks ago. And you realize how some people are going to such great lengths to stay within those guidelines. It uh, really was heartwarming for me to realize that my, my, even my grandchildren at 16 and 14, both the girls, uh, we're very conscious of what was going on, very aware of it, and very concerned and very curious about any thoughts that could be done on their part to be able to make this work better for, particularly if you could call me, older people. Uh, again, the God moment part of it was the opportunity for the first time in almost a year and a half to see these people. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. I had a, a God moment um, last week, uh, similar to Tom's. Um, I was picking up something as to eat as I was heading into Kelowna at Starbucks by the airport. And I went to pay for it. And the, the gal said, oh, the man in front of you had paid for my order. So. Oh, no. I, I will have to get that opportunity to be able to play it forward. Yes. Okay. Lots of kind people out there. Any others? Since we've moved here, we've had to change a lot of things in our life. And one of the things we've really missed is sitting around a campfire. And we had the God moment of John and Elaine Togut to invite us over for coffee around a campfire Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. And it was a beautiful sunny morning sitting out in the middle of their orchard and roasting marshmallows and distancing and being in the fresh air. And it was just like feeling a little bit of home in Lloydminster that, uh, was special to share with friends. So a lovely God moment. Now a way we can do it in the, with the restrictions safely. Thank you so much, Melanie. Any others? Louise, were you speaking? Yes. Yeah, I have a humorous one. Uh, I was shopping the other day and I ran into my girlfriend who was with her grandson and she introduced used him to me, she said, uh, John, I'd like you to meet my friend, Louise. He looked at her, he said, you know her grandmother? And I said, no, he said, well, you look like my grandmother, but you're much younger. <laughs> <laughs> I took it with a big smile and gave him a hug. I shouldn't have done that, but I did. <laughs> Any further God moments? Okay, hearing none, let's begin the service. Uh, welcome to Winfield United and our service for this Sunday. No matter who you are, what you believe, no matter where you've been, you are welcome here. Whenever we worship at this place, we acknowledge we are standing on the traditional and unceded territory of the Sayok, Okanagan peoples. We are grateful for their stewardship of the land and its resources for the people who have lived here and their teachings. Now, if you have a candle, let us light our candles together. This candle dances with the presence of the spirit, reminding us of the warmth of the community, which shines across our spaces this day. God, whatever you are, 
wherever you are, by whatever name we know you, let us feel your presence among us as we gather this morning. In our circus of uncertainty and worry, you are the fixed point of calm. In our times of stress and fear, you are the settled feeling of peace. In our well-worn routines, you are the flash of inspiration. In our most ordinary moments, you come to us, you transform us, you lead us into the holy. And our first hymn this morning is, There's a Spirit in the Air. Our first uh, reading this morning is by Penny Gamble from Matthew 26, verses 47 to 54. Thanks, Adam. When he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent by the chief priests and elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I kiss is the man, arrest him. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, greetings rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus said to him, friend, do what you are here to do. Then they came and took hold of Jesus and arrested him. But one of those with Jesus grabbed his sword, drew it out, and struck the high priest's slave, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, put your sword back in its place. For all who take hold of the sword will die by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot call on my father and that he would send me more than 12 legions of angels right now? How then would the scriptures that say it must happen this way be fulfilled? May these words open us to spirit's presence. And, and may wisdom come to us this day. day. Thank you. Um, I chose this passage which I'm sure most of us are familiar with as one of the most dramatic moments in the New Testament. Um, for an aspect of it that might be easy to overlook. And that is the fact that when the soldiers arrive to arrest Jesus, they are reliant upon a sign from Judas uh, 
as to the identity of Jesus. That is to say that he is not immediately obvious. Um, he doesn't stand out. As Mike Fillon writes, according to the Gospel of Matthew, when Jesus was arrested in in the Garden of Gethsemane before the crucifixion, Judas Iscariot had to indicate to the soldiers whom Jesus was because they could not tell him apart from his disciples. Um, it is clear that his features were typical of Galilean Semites of his era. In other words, Jesus couldn't just tell the Romans the sign as to which of the um, similar looking individuals was the target for the Romans. And this meshes with some meditations that I've had upon the question of the appearance of Jesus, representations of him in our culture, and whether there is any significance to the question. And I wanted to, if we can get the technology working here, share my screen now. Uh, okay. So these are some images that I have compiled in my photography around the world, um, pointing to different representations of Jesus uh, in different cultures and at different periods of history. Um, Beginning with this image from Suffolk in England, the Church of St. Peter and Paul, um, several images, in fact, that are perhaps our most familiar um, portrait of Jesus as uh, the westernized, Caucasian-looking, uh, platonic ideal, very Greek-influenced, I think, of the wise teacher. Um, one of the most famous images of Christ from the Hagia Sophia Museum in Istanbul, the former church, uh, Byzantine church. Um, from Vank Cathedral in Isfahan, Iran, where there is a lively Armenian Christian community. Uh, and this following image as well from Lake Van in Turkey, the product of Armenian culture again reflecting that image of Jesus, the wise Western Greek-influenced um, teacher and philosopher. And the last of those images from the Regional Historical Museum in Rusa in Bulgaria. Um, unified, I guess, by uh, a common image of Christ as long-haired, a generally rather westernized and Europeanized um, in appearance. Um, this photograph of uh, a sculpture of Jesus at the St. Vitus Cathedral in Prague is maybe a little different. Uh, it's Europeanized in the sense that Jesus looks like a, a Eastern European woodsman coming back from the forest a little more weather beaten and aged in his features than we are perhaps um, useful to see or used to seeing. And um, it perhaps reminds us of one of, if not the most famous images of Jesus, which is the Shroud of Turin. And the rather similar, I'll go back and forth, but the rather similar um, image of uh, the, the weathered features. Now, note that the Shroud of Turin image um, depicts the figure as somewhere between, uh, sorry, I don't know the um, metric, five foot ten and six foot two. Um, again, with long hair, the beard, the classic image of Christ. We're probably increasingly used to cultural reinterpretations, and I just wanted to show several from Latin America and Africa that show how the prevailing understanding and interpretation of Christ's, Christ's appearance is subject to these cultural influences. 
from Matagalpa in Nicaragua, a notably um, darker, black-haired Jesus. Certainly one of the spookiest images of Jesus I've ever seen from Sinsunsan in Mexico. And I think probably reflecting some of the pre-Hispanic visual arts of um, the Aztec realm in that case. From Aksum in Ethiopia, uh, a depiction of Jesus's baptism, uh, a somewhat Africanized, at least North African, Horn of African looking Jesus. And one of the very rare images, although one suspects the artist is playing with perspective a bit here, in which Jesus is shown as physically smaller or shorter than other people who are in the frame with him. And lastly, I think this is lastly, a couple of images of the famous uh, Cristo Negro, the Black Christ at the Iglesia de San Felipe in Portobello in Panama, a full ebony portrait now, Africanized, a close up of his features there and a major point of pilgrimage for the African descended population of Panama. All of this is by the way of leading into the article that and images that provoked this reflection for today. And they came from of all places, Popular Mechanics Magazine. And one of the most popular articles that Popular Mechanics has ever published. This was in 2002. And as you can see from the title page, it is sampling the work of forensic scientists and archaeologists working with what is known, particularly from cemeteries and burials, of the physique and appearance of people in Palestine in Jesus's time. And the image that the experts on the forensic and archaeological side arrived at um, was influenced, among other things, by that passage from Matthew that Penny read at the outset, that Jesus was probably quite normal or, or ordinary looking for his time. Uh, most of the images that we've seen of Jesus feature him with long flowing hair. And Mike Fillon, the, art, the article's author, points out that um, in 1 Corinthians, Paul mentions having seen Jesus in person, an appearance of Jesus, and then later in the chapter describes long hair on a man as disgraceful. Paul writes, if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him. And Philon asks, would Paul really be mentioning an, a physical appearance of Jesus and then later on condemning men with long hair? Had Jesus in that appearance had long hair? Uh, and as a result, we get this image of Christ based upon um, an archaeological reading of what was the typical appearance of Palestinian males at this time. Um, note that the hair is close cropped. Uh, the argument is that it would be unusual for a man, certainly for a Jewish religious leader, to have had long hair that was generally seen as effeminate in the period. Um, another quote from Philan's article, the historical record also resolved the issue of Jesus's height. I'm going to switch here to another image that shows a, diff a slightly different angle on the reconstruction. From an analysis of skeletal remains, archeologists have firmly established that the average build of a Semite male at the time of Jesus was five foot one inch, 
with an average weight of about 110 pounds. And he adds, since Jesus worked outdoors as a carpenter until he was about 30 years old, it is reasonable to assume he was more muscular and physically fit than westernized portraits suggest. His face was probably weather beaten, which would have made him appear older as well. And there you have the uh, quote in question. Um, I wanted to just conclude with some reflections on the images of, that we've seen and the questions that we've raised. How important in our minds is it that Jesus be, for example, tall? That Jesus be, for example, handsome? That he be slender and aquiline? That he be fair complexioned and light eyed? that he have hair spilling over his shoulders in luxuriant golden locks. All of these features seem to be unlikely according to what we know of the historical and archeological record. And a simple prayer that I have used since I passed through a personal crisis last year is Jesus, walk with me. And since I came across the popular mechanics article, I've tried to imagine myself sometimes, a six foot three guy, walking alongside Jesus, and he come up, comes up maybe to my shoulder. It's unsettling on some level. It runs counter to our unexamined conventions, our subconscious sense that there should be some reflection of spiritual grandeur in physical stature. But I feel I should work with that image, which is probably a lot more historically accurate, to avoid making Jesus the captive of my sentimental notions and prejudices. Because surely it is not the human face and physique of Jesus that is central to all of us, but his message and his example and the path that he shows us toward love and reconciliation and salvation.
We'll now have our minute for mission read again by Penny Gamble. And this minute for mission is experiencing magic at Camp McDougall. I haven't been there, but maybe somebody, some people who are watching have. There is no place like camp for campers and staff alike to live life to the fullest, experience the beauty and wonderful wonder of creation and build meaningful relationships. Thanks to your gifts for mission and service, campers can continue to have meaningful experiences at campsite Camp McDougall in Thessalon, Ontario. The Camp McDougall staff arrive to have a positive effect on the lives of the young people spending time there and they recognize the importance of their role in this experience and provide guidance, entertainment, leadership, example, and friendship. Making the most of this opportunity creates the ultimate camp experience for everyone. As a United Church camp, Camp McDougall is an entity both rich in tradition and dedicated to encouraging new ideas. Throughout the years, many people have contributed a great deal of time and effort to make the camp what it is today. Board members, staff members, counselors, and even campers have the potential to contribute to the ongoing development and success of this organization. Camp McDougall is blessed with the raw materials for a great summer a fantastic location on the shore of Lake Huron near Thessalon, Ontario. An enthusiastic and capable staff, and most important, lots of excited campers ready to experience the magic. If mission and service is giving is already a regular part of your life, thank you so much. If you have not given, please join me in making mission and service a regular part of your life of faith. Loving our neighbor is at the heart of our mission and service. Thank you very much, Penny. You're welcome. Turning to prayers of the people, at this time, we unite our energies in the conviction that when two or three of us are gathered together, healing power lives among us we can tap into a greater source of energy and compassion. This morning, we focus ourselves on the people of war-torn Tigray province in Ethiopia, those suffering the world's worst humanitarian crisis in Yemen, and all the peoples of the world struggling with the resurgence of the coronavirus. May I invite any of you to contribute your own concerns here? I guess for me, uh, for me, uh, Adam, I think particularly of the people who are hurt again by the new lockdown. Uh, people in assisted living homes where they are alone anyway in their room and now cannot have visitors, cannot even encounter the staff other than nurses, meals delivered to the door and then people run away. And, and uh, the level of loneliness and isolation must be devastating. Thank you, Jim. Anyone else? Hi, um, Adam. I want to say something about my sister, Sandy, who is, um, has recently been diagnosed with cancer. It's lymphoma. And um, she lives in Ontario, so a long way from me. Uh, and so I'm constantly thinking about her. Her treatment has not started yet, but um, is inevitable next week. So anyway, thinking about you, Sandy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arlene. Any others? 
Yes, <clears throat> if I might counter a bit on what Jim was saying, <clears throat> I am fortunate enough in the care home where Fred is that I can see him for half an hour once a week. And the joy that comes to me when he comes through the door as he's being wheeled in in his wheelchair, because he can't walk anymore, he's in a wheelchair. And the smile on his face, and for the first time when he came in last Monday, he said, hello, sweetheart. The fact that he, re that he knows me and that he remembers who I am makes that half hour just so precious. And I just am so grateful that I'm able to do this. And my heart goes out to all of the others who are in a similar situation and whose care home is not open to visitors. Thank you so much, Louise. Would anyone else like to contribute? Yes, from Tom Thank and Muriel. And as, as you can all see, Muriel has joined me. Uh, she thinks this is a come as you are party. She just kind of came out of bed. But, um, I have a prayer of gratitude uh, for the, uh, the um, health workers. Uh, on Thursday, uh, the, uh, the ambulance attendants, uh, the folks at the hospital uh, were just really, really wonderful, uh, very caring, very thorough, uh, fully understanding of Muriel's uh, situation. And uh, I'm just so thankful for what we have. Um, I also have to uh, uh, express prayer of gratitude to the dentists at Aunt's Dentistry on uh, Highway 33 because they were the folks that called 911 and uh, they, uh, the dentists and staff came out and assisted Muriel while we were waiting for the ambulance. And uh, it's just so great to see so much uh, uh, so much uh, support. Uh, we, we live in a society where we tend to hear about negative things, but the reality is, is there's a lot of good that happens, and I'm thankful for that. Thank you very much. Uh, Catherine and I were made aware yesterday that some friends of ours uh, from our adoptive community the father of the family has uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or Lou Gehrig's disease and has been in care for about eight months and has now contracted, Lou, contracted COVID and in, yesterday was in his final hours. And so if we just want to offer prayers to the Alexander family in Langley, knowing that mom will be raising four kids by herself now. Thank you, Sharon. We know that there are some among us who are feeling torn apart by circumstances beyond their control. And again, I would invite you to name your concern and to allow a moment of silence so that the rest of us can focus our energy and our compassion. Is there anything that someone would like to add? The warmth in our hearts attests to the depth of our feelings. Each of us has a preferred prayer, a favored set of words, and I invite you now to say that prayer for yourself and to yourself. Amen. Finally, we pray for those we name in our community who are in need of our support, our care and concern, for the McCubrey family, for the Phipps family, for Lynn Roming, for Don and Bev, for Lynn and Don, for Greg, for Jean, for Kevin, for Shirley, for Sandy, for Jim and Sharon Taylor, Catherine and Stephen, 
for Harvey Walmsley and for Tom and Muriel. We gather all of these prayers into one and in this silence, pray the words that have the most meaning for us or simply reflect on all that has been shared. Amen. Our closing hymn is Deep in Our Hearts, MV 154. <laughs> I send by personal thanks to all of you for the privilege of being able to lead the service today. And now we go forth. And as we go, we will count our blessings, embody, embody our, our faith, faith, live, live an love authentic love life, life, never look never down, look down, down and struggle for life. life. Notice behind every face, face, face there is a soul at work, and know that you know wherever that you go, you know, the, spirit the Spirit of God, of God is already, already there. there. Amen. Amen.